Welcome to Town Meeting Television's continuing coverage of General Election 2020. Today we're talking to some of the uncontested candidates from South Burlington and also Burlington South End. We have Barbara Rachelson from District 66. That's my neighborhood. Welcome, Barbara. <laughs> and we have Maida Townsend, who is from South Burlington District 74, and John Kalaki, who is from South Burlington 73. Martin Lalonde, who could not join us, is also uncontested. I'm I have to make sure I have all the districts right. He's in 7-1. And as you noted before, Ann Pugh is in a contested race in District 7-2. So thank you so much for joining us. I just want to remind mm -hmm. folks, if you would like to call, we certainly will welcome your calls at 802-862-3966. So we're going to just start with opening statements. And Barbara Rachelson, why don't you tell us why you're running for re-election and what qualifies you for the position? Thank you, Lauren. So I'm Barbara Rachelson. I'm running for re-election. Um, and my background is I am a social worker. I um, don't do direct social work. I went to um, grad school to work on policy because I really um, have been committed to social change um, since my high school and college days, I guess. And um, I've been a, um, an employer. I have um, run uh, nonprofit organizations. I've been in the CEO role of, of two different nonprofit organizations for a total of 33 years. Um, I have particularly been committed to working on issues related to children and families. Also, um, some of the serious problems that um, our society is struggling with now, addiction, um, mental health challenges, poverty. And um, I am a dedicated uh, legislator. I am, my colleagues will uh, vouch for me that I am a sort of an obsessive researcher and want to always see what the evidence um, shows and like how have these policies played out in other places. I am not a fan of law of anecdote and we seem to do a lot of that in Vermont. Um, I also have served on a number of boards. I'm a mom, I was a working mother and um, I'll end there. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll talk about some of the issues that are important to you coming up. Thank you. Okay. Representative Maida Townsend, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us why you're running for re-election and why you're qualified. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm running for re-election to offer stability uh, for my constituents in this uh, very unstable time frame. Uh, the experience that I bring to the work is eight years having served in the legislature, the first six years on house government operations, and the last two years, this most recent biennium, on House Appropriations. Thank you so much. That was very succinct. Excellent. <laughs> John Kalaki, um, you are running, this would be your second term. The first term you had a bit of a contest and now you're uncontested. So that must be a little bit of a relief. Uh, it is, and I did run into my opponent from two years ago in the post office the other day. We had a nice visit. Uh, we're, we're all friends, of course. Uh, I retired from running the Flynn Center in downtown Burlington uh, for eight years, two years ago, and ran for my first term. And so as a citizen legislator in my first term, it was extraordinary for me because I was wanting this next part of my life to be about service. And in my first two years, I really focused on affordable housing, early education, livable wages, small businesses, the environment, recovery homes, mitigating homelessness, and improving conditions for women in our prison in South Burlington. I uh, have been, it's been a profound two years, and I really hope that I can, um, I'm running uncontested, so I, as we rebuild our personal, um, social and civic lives, I really wanna help Vermonters and continue my service. Thank you so much. Maida, why don't we start with you? I'm going to hop right to the budget question. Um, what does the FY22 budget look like to you? And how, how, how are you going to navigate the competing interests? Well, um, there is 
um, a set approach, which we use for the budget. Uh, we take testimony from our policy committees, the, policy, the committee's jurisdiction. We take testimony from all of the governmental agencies and we take, policy, uh, we take uh, testimony from the public and the advocates. And uh, then we set about, um, then, then we, we set about trying to put together what resources we have at hand to meet the needs, to, to best meet the needs of uh, the people as we have understood them. Now, in, in this context, in this time frame, uh, we have heard from our economist, uh, our economist uh, resources that uh, budgeting, in this COVID era is somewhat like trying to nail jello to a wall or to ride a wild tiger. And having been a member of House Appropriations, uh, putting together multiple budgets in this uh, current calendar year, I can testify that yes, indeed, that is true. Um, when we get to uh, January to start work on first um, a budget adjustment for the current fiscal year 21 and also to start work on the full year uh, fiscal year 22. Uh, we really don't know yet what we will be facing just as we really did not know what we would be facing when we came back in in August to deal with the full year FY21 budget. But we do have um, very healthy reserves that we did not have to touch in any meaningful big way uh, to, 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 to meet the needs in the 21 budget, the fiscal year 21 budget. And um, we will simply have to assess where we are. Uh, I have to be very realistic and share that it, it will be very, very difficult, even with our uh, over $200 million in, in reserves that are still sitting there to be used if necessary. Um, we were very fortunate to have the $1.25 billion from the federal government in COVID money to, to, to use for the FY21 budget. And we believe we used those dollars very, very well. Um, so I'm going to just pause you because um, it's almost impossible to, in an extremely short time, summarize the work yeah. that you have done on the Appropriations Committee. And That's so I think you've given us a very high level and we could talk for an hour on this question um, because you've really been on the front line there. I'm, I'm wondering, John, you are not on the Appropriations Committee, but why don't you tell us your view of the challenges ahead with the budget? and and well, your political philosophy on that. Sure, I sit in general housing and military affairs, so affordable housing is something that we work a lot on, and that's certainly a big issue. Um, and it's a concern about how we keep building um, and, and making Vermont more affordable. I, I want to go back. Meta is quite extraordinary in, in the budget, but in all this uncertainty, you know, we did work with the House, the Senate, and the administration and there was a balanced budget of $7.15 billion that was passed. And we continued programs, you know, and we didn't really dip in significantly into the reserves, which is really important. Now that COVID money was essential, that 1.2. You know, we're hoping that there'll be an additional stimulus package after November 3rd, or we hope it'll come in. And because and, it's needed, it is gonna be very difficult. But I think what we learned in, COVID is how to work differently. And I'm new to this the week, but I really saw in three weeks time, we turned around the budget for the nine months and stuff because we all worked together with kind of shared principles in a way and, and less siloed. And I think there's some systemic issues of uh, the benefits of, of working that way. And I think really one of the things is not how can we do more with less because the state has been doing that. And we'll talk about, about nonprofit sector later on. But we have to talk about how to do better with less. And I think we've learned some things with our COVID relief money, how we can do better. And, and I hope those um, examples resonate and continue to teach us. 
Thank you so much. Barbara Rachelson, is anything you've heard resonate with you? And what is your thinking about the budget? So, um, a couple of things. One is, I think it's a chance to, I mean, I think John is totally right. We can't do more with less. In fact, I think we might want to do um, less in some cases. I know that there are um, efficiencies that we can still realize from doing some educational consolidation, which I know is a touchy big subject. I won't get into that, but also um, corrections. I'm excited to see or to hear that we're going to rethink corrections. It's, it's a gigantic um, dollar figure and our um, results from it are terrible. Like if we, we just, if, if healthcare were that bad a result, we would be screaming and yelling. So we know that there are places we are spending money now that I think we really need to look differently. Same thing with the revenues. Um, I just think that we also have seen one weird opportunity with COVID, which is people moving to the state. And so we need to look at um, people who can afford to buy uh, houses over a million dollars or very luxury items. Um, because we know, I'm hearing from constituents more and more how tough it is financially. Like, like as tough as people have felt in the past, it's w worse now. So we do have to really, it's not going to, I hope we don't do business as usual. And the uh, under um, Representative Toll's leadership, they have involved the policy committees more, which has been great. But we also need a mechanism to say, we can save $3 million a year, but we're not going to do that in the first year. Because again, we're always looking at that 12 months. And if we don't have a mechanism to kind of recognize that something will bring savings later, you know, it's that whole prevention thing that we talk about. We, it's like, well, we have to have it by June 30th when the budget closes. So again, I'm hoping we can do some like out of the ordinary thinking. Thank you. I'm just gonna remind our viewers, if you'd like to give us a call, we're talking with candidates who are uncontested in District 6-6, the south end of Burlington and in South Burlington. So you are welcome to call us at 802-862-3966. So John, you mentioned the um, impact of COVID on the budget process. Well, talk about what you think the impact of this health emergency has been on the state and where the opportunities are or, or you know, the real areas of concern. Just kind of sure. your analysis about Vermont in the time of COVID. Well, I'm gonna talk about my experience on the committee and one thing that we worked on during COVID is we had to really get our arms around the homeless population in Vermont because they could not really stay in shelters and congregate settings. We had to isolate and move people more safely into hotel rooms. And every January, there's a point in time survey done across the state saying, how large is our uh, homeless population in Vermont? And those numbers are usually about 1,000 to 1,200 people, and they're imprecise because it's a day. Uh, but during the height of the pandemic, we had over 1,900 people in hotels, and 245 of those folks were kids. And so that's a big number, but it's also a number that we can get our arms around. And the amazing thing is we put an $85 million package together, COVID relief funds, that was systemic that uh, built out, uh, we made shelters. Uh, they were renovated so that they could be socially distanced. We bought uh, derelict properties and made them into um, homes for people. We have um, a program for landlords with derelict properties. They could get $30,000 to upgrade their property if they, for five years, allowed homeless or low income Vermonters to live there. So we began to change some of the dynamics. and. Um, what is interesting to me is that this is a game changer for the way we really work with this population because there's multiple needs. It's not just housing. I mean, housing is healthcare, 
but you also have a lot of wraparound services. And we really understood that integrating them was the, the way to go and not keeping things in silos. So for me, I think a lasting impact is that if we look at uh, rehousing people in a systemic way, there's a possibility to really significantly eat away at that 2,000 people who really don't have homes in our state. Thank you. You know, you, you bring up something that's really interesting, and Barbara, you might opt to talk more about this, but problems that seemed really difficult and insurmountable before the COVID emergency, all of a sudden, people were able to get with it and bridge the gaps and collaborate and solve the problem. And I wonder if you saw examples of that, Barbara Rachelson. Um, well, for sure, I must say, and uh, Meta may have a better take up on this since she and I started in the legislature at the same time. There was a lot of incredible goodwill among all three parties and getting things done um, in a way that I don't think I've seen, like in general, I mean, Vermont's pretty good, but it was extraordinary um, how well everybody worked together. Um, and I know um, locally with the effort John just talked about, I mean, it was pretty impressive. Um, I've talked to a, a few of the local providers, including Rita Markley. I know how impressive it was that they were able to quickly house so many people. And I don't think anyone got COVID. I mean, it was just really of the homeless population. It was, it was phenomenal um, because people don't always um, make that time for collaboration. And what I was hearing from um, my nonprofit buddies were, people, it was that same thing we were seeing in Montpelier. People were really mission focused and um, did what they had to do. And thank goodness we live in a place that we have such caring people. Yeah, thank you. Maida Townsend, tell us about um, your view of the COVID health emergency and what impact it's having on Vermont from your perspective. Well, um, I think it um, provided a, a very clear light very quickly as to the fragility that an awful lot of Vermonters live with. Um, it's, it's particularly clear um, within communities that um, have been over time marginalized in various ways. And part of what we looked at as a legislature, both chambers as well as the administration, was how we could be supportive as quickly as possible in as many different ways, in a meaningful way, not just band-aids. Uh, for instance, what John was referencing is going upstream to deal with the, the uh, housing issue, not just continuing to do quote unquote emergency housing, but to look at a means for providing good solid housing for folks moving forward, a lasting kind of solution. And everywhere we could, it, I felt, in various bills as well as in the budget, wherever there was an opportunity to reach out to provide extra support to those who are who are among the most fragile in, uh, in the state, that opportunity was taken, whether it was uh, reaching out through the budget with regard to health disparities, uh, communities of, 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 of color, uh, Native American communities, uh, the homeless, uh, for folks living without um, good shelter, um, in a whole lot of various ways, effort was focused there in, in, in um, let me just leave that there since you wanted to focus on, on health. We, we also saw that um, it was necessary to provide stabilization for the healthcare system writ large. And we managed to do that in a meaningful way and framing it in such a way that it wasn't only the largest, most powerful players on the scene who were able to take advantage of what funds we could provide. We wanted to make sure that the smaller entities 
uh, had an equal chance and, and in some instances more of a chance so because they were so little um, great that's good so, yeah I mean yeah. again COVID is one of those other topics that will take us a lifetime but, to but Lauren unfold. Glenn I, I, Go ahead, I think John. a factor is that as a rural state we got 1.25 billion dollars and we had one of the highest per capita amount of money that came into our state because of our population. And so we had an opportunity and had, we had to turn it around very quickly um, uh, on this. And we had to listen to our providers who we have really under-resourced for a very long time. And so we were able to hear from them solutions that, so in my example, $85 million, that, that would be unheard of in any other budget year to say, if you had another $85 million, how could we do things differently? So I think this one-time infusion has been a game changer for systemic thinking. And now I think what we need to do is figure that out, as Barbara was saying, going forward, how do we look at this a little bit differently and listen to the nonprofit providers and, and the people doing the work in our state? And I just want to point out too that at least some of the nonprofit providers and partners that we work with on House Judiciary we were enticing them to do more and they were like, oh no. I mean, one thing is there was a, a very hard deadline to spend the money. And so I think some of the nonprofits didn't have the capacity to be able to, to pull that off. So that's unfortunate, but um, Vermont was very lucky. If, yeah. if I could, could I add in one little thing? Yeah, please. Um, while, while it, that uh, federal infusion, the $1.25 billion was incredibly important. I think we need to give uh, due regard also to how Vermonters, large numbers of Vermonters paid those deferred taxes. You know, the taxes that were deferred back in April. It was astonishing. It, it, it w went beyond what had been envisioned would come in in the middle of the summer in terms of deferred tax money being uh, paid. Um, incredibly helpful in meeting the needs of Vermonters and their communities. There was also the work within the departments and agencies. They scrubbed their budgets like crazy, scrub, 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 and came up with uh, something like $30 million uh, worth of what are called reversions that we could drop to the bottom line to use again in support of Vermonters and their communities. Thank you. Maida, I'm gonna ask you the education question. Um, yeah. This is yeah. you know deep background for you and, and, and I think education financing has been talked about since 1990 when we started this channel. <laughs> um, so maybe you talk about that. Tell us what you think is next for education financing. And I'm going to go find while you do that a light because I realize that I'm in the dark. In the dark. So um, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and answer that and I will, yes. um, we'll all be listening. Okay. Um, well, clearly the, the, uh, the funding mechanism for uh, pre-K through 12 schools has gotten increasingly complex over the years. Um, a piece that, if this were an easy uh, situation or an easy question to solve, it would have been solved by now. There's nothing easy about this. There's no magic answer. But there is out there an entity called the, uh, the Tax Structure Commission. It was established by statute in 2018, and they've been working like mad uh, for the last two years. They're due to make their final report in January of 2021, and they've, they've met over 25 times. They've been taking testimony from a, a variety of sources, a variety of people and organizations, and it's their job to make recommendations as to, uh, based on all of the input and their study, uh, how we should move forward as it relates to our tax structure. Uh, it, obviously right at the head of the list there, property taxes and the education tax. Um, the, a similar tax commission uh, presented its work back in 2010, suggested, for instance, using uh, looking at 
uh, how we deal with tax expenditures, that sort of thing. Um, but we, we never made much headway on their recommendations. Hopefully, now that 10 more years have gone by and people have gotten more and more just really uh, hammered, shall I say. It's a, it's a huge burden that people are carrying. Um, uh, hopefully the recommendations which this commission brings forward in January will will uh, we'll see good good conversation good work to follow through moving Thank forward you. yeah um, John you you would be next on your approach to education financing what needs to happen from your view well one thing I thought made up might have uh, mentioned, but I'll mention it, and I, I, she'll correct me if I didn't get it quite right. But what we did do is we held education property tax is for fiscal year 21 to what they would have been if COVID hadn't happened. So there wouldn't be an additional burden on Vermonters. So that was one strategy there. As a freshman in the, the halls in Montpelier, I hear whispered that, you know, Maybe property tax isn't the way we should go, and maybe we should really look at income tax and taxing in that way for our, our schools in Vermont. And I think it's, it's an interesting idea to kind of pursue and analyze more. I did read the Blue Ribbon Tax Force, and so we've had a lot of study done about this, and, but there's, I would say, um, a lot of inaction as well. And I think Nate is right, the tipping point has happened, and I really hope we do look at, um, either is property tax the best way or what other ways to do it. I think that's really what we need to do in this coming year. Don't we in effect have an income tax-based education there the, financing? There is, the in, there is the income sensitivity piece. In, income sensitivity. But I, I'm saying that take it away from property tax and tie it directly into our state income tax. Yeah, okay. Would be separately, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Barbara? Barbara Rachelson, your view on education financing, what's next? Okay, so I spent my first um, term serving on House Ed, and there are probably three to five people in the state that can explain how, how it works. So one thing is we need a system that at least people can understand because that makes it way worse. Um, there's also some weird built-in dynamics of um, whatever budgets get approved, those somebody's got to pay for them, and it's not always that school district. So um, I know uh, I will miss Representative Donovan, who would repeatedly say to constituents when they said, "You're raising our property, our education taxes." It's like you're the one that's voting on your school um, budget, but still it's a bad system because, because again, I, I hear so, so much from people how high their property taxes are, especially in Burlington. It's, I definitely have had many constituents move out of Burlington. Um, not all of them have left the state. It's, it's concerning and I've had a couple constituents try to game the income sensitivity because they're right on the threshold and they will take time off without pay in order to come in right under it. Um, I would like to see us not, we have fewer school districts, we also have fewer students. We need to put a cap on administrative costs statewide because we're paying way more than we should for each supervisory union because each one needs their own whole financial uh, infrastructure. Yeah, I, I just have a quick side question. Do we know anything about the impact of all these people that are moving into Vermont? Is there gonna be some, is that a net gain property tax expected or is it just a wash because other people owned those buildings before these people? Um, Maybe. Well, there's the transfer. To, there's the transfer tax, which is a good thing. Um, I don't know. I thought you were going to ask if they have kids and if they are bringing more children into. I don't know. I mean, it, the data is like eight. Yeah, I have not been able to get too much detailed data yet. But I bet when we have our briefing in December, they'll 
present us with whatever um, population data is available. Maida, did you have anything to add on that one? No, no, I think Barbara's quite accurate that we, we, we don't have the, the information yet to, to, to know for sure what the situation is in that regard. Thank you. Let me ask you the F35 question, starting with you, John Kalaki. Um, people are very concerned about the noise of the F-35s, what kind of mitigation efforts are underway or do you think needs to happen that could be affected through the legislature? Uh, well, in, the, uh, in my committee, uh, General Housing and Military Affairs, we do the National Guard and so the F-35 is a very um, pertinent topic that, of discussion in our committee. Um, our committee did not move a resolution forward uh, asking to ban the F-35s. Um, other people in the house are advocates for it. Um, you know, it's a federal decision. It, it is not a local decision. So uh, I live in South Burlington. I know how loud they are. I have a horse in Williston and the horses completely freak out when those planes go over the barn and it's detrimental to them. Uh, you know, I'm afraid they're going to break out of the pastures and stuff because it is so loud. So I, I know I have friends who have kids and it's very, it's like we're living in a military zone, but it is a federal issue. And so there's almost nothing that um, our state legislature can do about this, unfortunately. The airport, and we've been all involved in looking at getting sound mitigation, which is essential uh, in the corridors. I mean, parts of uh, my native district has been destroyed by these planes um, in the airport. And so it's essential that we do protect and rebuild um, the, the sound for the homes in Winooski and in South Burlington and Burlington um, and the schools as well. They, these planes are going over the schools, right over the schools. And so I think that that's a, a more effective place for the legislature to really impact uh, citizens who live here. I'm gonna hop um, to Maida and ask you as a South Burlington rep, what do you, what's your view on the noise mitigation? What do you think, what's gotta happen next? Well. Um, first, if I could clarify, uh, dear John, um, my, my district uh, lost so many houses um, back before the F-35s before, yes. even arrived, yeah, okay. because the uh, sound levels from the airport had already reached uh, a, a, a level which was considered uh, uninhabitable. Um, yeah. So anyway. Um, and just for the very public record, as folks in my district know, I have been opposed to the F-35s being here ever since they became an issue. Um, but as John pointed out, it was a decision made uh, quite out of our hands at the federal level. Um, there is work being done. The, the uh, airport itself just had a meeting last night, actually, um, for the for the public, uh, a two-hour meeting explaining um, the, the how the master plan is moving forward and made reference to the efforts um, they are making uh, with varying degrees of success to uh, get federal money to support uh, sound mitigation. And there's going to be a, a pilot program, I think it's for 10, for 10 homes, um, just to, to, to see how this would work to um, provide the, uh, the necessary um, insulation, windows, doors, that sort of thing to um, mitigate the, the sound. There's also uh, work to, to help at Chamberlain School, the little elementary school in my district, which is just a stop, uh, it's, a, it's a strong stone's throw from the airport. Um, the, the sound levels, if the windows are closed in that little school, the sound levels are below the, uh, the on paper objectionable levels. That's not getting into what it really is like to live with the, those levels of sound. But if the windows are closed, the sound levels inside the school meet the, the requirements. But since you can't open a window, to maintain those levels, they're looking at uh, that through the airport uh, providing money for an HVAC system so that the air within the school can be um, 
fresh and the way it should be kind of thing. So, you know, it's an ongoing issue and will take years to cover all of the homes. I mean, decades, literally decades to cover all of the homes, which um, might well be uh, uh, with, eligible, eligible for the, the, the work on their homes. And there's also the possibility that the airport might want to buy some homes from residents and do the sound mitigation and then resell. Mm -hmm. All right. I think there's pretty much been um, accord now that no more homes are coming down, if I understand correctly. Okay, thank you. thank you, Barbara, go ahead. I know the legislature, um, the mayor, uh, our mayor, uh, Mayor Weinberger and the mayor of Winooski met with sort of the Burlington Winooski delegation before um, this year's um, part of the biennium and asked for our support for the matching part of a, this federal grant. That would be the sound and also weatherization. Um, so I know some of these federal monies do require a state match and um, that might be the case coming up again. Um, so yeah, I, I must say, especially with um, changing their schedule to evening flying, I've heard um, more from folks about the noise. Thanks, Barbara. Why don't you, um, we're, we're getting down to our last question here. Why don't you <laughs> talk about systemic racism in Vermont and the role the legislature has played, if you think it is adequate, if you think reparations are in order, and if you think an apology is in order for um, how we have treated Black people in this state. Um, for sure, I um, think that we should be looking at the reparations issue um, I, and the apology. Um, I'm not sure it would have to be a really sincere, meaningful policy. I mean, not uh, apology, I'm sorry. Um, there's a bill that I put in last time that um, Kaya Morris and I were working on when she was in the legislature. And I'm really gonna push for it. I've talked to Coach Christie about um, pushing for it again, which is to have a racial impact um, information available before we pass a bill to see what the what the policy implications might be on um, minorities and people of color in particular. Um, about 10 states have done it. And it's way better to find out before we pass a law that it's gonna have some unintended consequences than after. Um, it's a lot like asking for a fiscal note and I think it's important for us to try to stop the, the continuing to, to do more harm in, the, in addition to making reparations. Thank you. Maida, um, your view of the role of the state in stopping systemic racism, meaning the legislature and the need for reparations and or apology. Well, I think we've made beginning steps in this, particularly in this last uh, biennium, not only in terms of uh, direct uh, efforts at dealing with uh, racial inequity, um, for instance, in terms uh, uh, and uh, inequity for all um, for for all folks uh, in previously um, marginalized populations. Uh, for instance, we had an equity stimulus bill, um, which provided for our, our immigrant populations um, the, the same kind of stimulus support that others in Vermont received, but these folks didn't because of their immigration status. Well, we, we took care of that. Um, we've uh, we dealt with health, at least a step with regard to health disparities and getting a handle on that as the racial uh, issues uh, exist in the context of law enforcement. Um, we took a step took a step with regard to having more civilian uh, individuals on the training council, the, the the group that oversees training of law enforcement folks who have um, lived experience in terms of um, uh, their being part of various um, 
crosscuts of our population here in state. We now have with the Vermont uh, State Police through the budget, um, a, a civilian a person of color co-directing the fair and impartial policing program. So we have taken steps, but they're only steps. And, and there are others that I haven't listed there. This, the whole question about reparations and apologizing, I think apologizing is a, a very nice thing, but personally, I would prefer to see action that makes a difference in people's lives. Um, there, was a, oh, there, was, there was a bill, a different bill, uh, H478, which was around this whole, um, this, this whole biennium, which would have set up, if it had passed, it would have set up a task force to consider, to consider this very issue of reparations and apology and to make recommendations on what appropriate remedies would be for this state. But it didn't pass. It, didn't it, it never saw action, okay. never saw yep. anything in the committee. I don't, they ran out of okay. time, I think. Yeah, okay. Very good. Thank you, John. Your response to this question. Well, I, I, I think it's every committee's and each committee's responsibility to look at this in their own policy making. And so, you know, in preparation for this, I thought, well, what did general housing and military affairs do uh, about systemic racism? Increasing the minimum wage, protecting victims of domestic or sexual violence from housing discrimination, renaming Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day making sure indigenous names are in all state parks, uh, agreeing with the treaty signed hundreds of years ago to have free fishing and hunting licenses for our Abenaki people. We did eviction and foreclosure um, protections during this time. Um, we passed an inclusionary housing bill that you can no longer say a particular kind of housing is not appropriate for the character of a neighborhood. So that's, uh, it's called redlining, it's, it's, it's racist. Um, you know, we, I, today I submitted a request to uh, begin again our Homeless Bill of Rights that we had been working on. Um, our committee was working with eugenics uh, resolution and apology, and also to set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There was talk, should we combine that with the other work of the other committee? And it's like, well, I'm not sure we should combine everything into one because all of these things are important because, you know, the eugenics movement is a horrifying chapter in Vermont history of racism and, you know, literally sterilizing people because they were Abenaki or because they were disabled. Um, you know, so there's that. Paid family and medical leave is an issue that we want to bring back as well, and that's going to have impact in communities of color. So I think all of these things um, help with the issue of systemic racism in Vermont. Well, I want to thank the, thank you, John, for that response and thank the three of you for your public service. Um, we're very fortunate that you are willing to run for another season, another biennium. On November 3rd is the election and you will be voting, if you haven't already, on uh, Barbara Rachelson if you're in the south end of Burlington, District 6-6 and Maida Townsend, who's in District 7-4, and John Kalaki, who's in District 7-3. Uh, Martin Lalonde could not join us. He is also unopposed in District 7-2 in South Burlington, and Ann Pugh is in a contested race. No, Martin 7-1, Ann is 7-2. So thank you so much for joining us here tonight. It's just a pleasure to speak with you all, and thank you for watching Town Meeting Television's continuing coverage of town meeting, no, general election 2020. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you.